Good afternoon and good evening, sick, twisted weather freaks. This is another edition of This Week in Weather. I'm your host and meteorologist DT from weatherist.com, the commander of chaos, captain of confusion, and colonel of catastrophe. It's mid December. All the snow has disappeared here in Virginia, North Carolina, and we seem to be stuck in a warm pattern. So let's talk about what's going to happen in this pattern here over the next couple of weeks and what, if anything, is going to happen in January. So in this week, in this edition of this week of weather, I'm going to talk about first kind of a philosophical argument, and not necessarily having to do with the weather models per se, about why weather risk me got the December 10th snowstorm in North Carolina, Virginia correct, but NWS and all the TV met, Mets uh, pretty much missed it. Then I'll talk about the model December, the matting Julian oscillation, the teleconnections, the sudden stratospheric warming, and um, uh, January 2019. So uh, let's get right to it. Now let's start by taking a look at the snowstorm from December 10th and see what I got right and why I got it right. Now this is a snapshot of a feed from Zach Daniels Facebook page on Saturday morning where he wisely and correctly saw that the snow on Sunday was going to be substantially more than the one to three inches he and the NWS and everybody else was forecasting on Friday afternoon. Now, as many of you know, I've been talking about that, that event for several days. Now, if you play the video at the eight minute mark, the eight minute mark, he says the following. If you go back and take a look at every single winter weather event in the past, think of all those maps you see, they get spread all around the internet. They say 12 to 18 inches it's been a long time since we've had that much snow. We had one back in 2016. It just does not happen that way. Then he goes on to say how he wants a big snowstorm, but he says the models are not perfect. That's true, they're not. We have we got to learn from the past, looking at all those crazy snowfall totals in the past, and how many times did they really work out? How many times did we have a foot of snow in the forecasted, and we ended up getting one, two, or three inches? Happens all the time. Does it, Zach? Does that really happen all the time? I don't think so. So I don't know where that claim comes from, but that's bullshit, Zach. But never has one to three inch snow been forecast and all of a sudden we end up the foot. Never. That never happens. Yes, a actual meteorologist said this to explain why there was not going to be a big snow in Richmond. This is just stunning. I, I, I don't even know how... Uh, Wow. And then, of course, as he does updates during the day, you have to see this sort of uh, thing here. And then, of course, I, what I did was I enlarged um, this comment here. So you can read here. And, of course, what Mr. Daniel says is, I went for the biggest out mod plug at every time. And this is a lie. In fact, it's such a bad lie, I'm thinking of taking legal action against Mr. Daniels. Um, there are plenty of examples where I do not go for the biggest storm or the biggest event. And the fact that he's so ignorant and he doesn't understand my forecasting technique is particularly offensive. But more importantly is that he had the wisdom Saturday morning to update his forecast. I was doing that all during the week. Yet for some reason his updates are sound and scientific, but my updates during the week are not. I'm just going for the biggest snowfall. It, it's, it's, his arrogance is really stunning. Here's another one. So this person here, John Christopher Nolan, talked about this, and then he said, again, if it was 10 days ago, as a guest, come on, we missed big time, so on and so forth. And then another person said, I did not underplay it, and he says he never does. He always goes for the highest. That's just a lie. I mean, that's a slander is what that is. He's actually attacking me as a meteorologist and questioning my professional skills because his forecast sucked moose. So, um, you know, that's what he's doing there. That's just a cheap shot. And again, um, I guess what happens is that the only time he pays attention is when there's a snowstorm and I'm talking about it and he's downplaying it and then the big snow hits. So um, instead of admitting that his forecast is awful, he has to say that I go for a snowstorm every single time. In other words, what Zach isn't doing is Zach is not actually discussing the science. He's downplaying 
my forecasting ability in order to defend himself. And that's really kind of shitty. Now, let me explain something here. I know this seems like I'm bashing Zach Daniels. I am in some ways, but I'm also driving at a bigger point, so just pay attention here for one second, please. Zach Daniels is a good meteorologist, but he's a bad scientist. And like most NWS meteorologists and TV Mets, he doesn't understand risk and probability. Private sector energy and grain meteorologists do, however. And um, let me explain to you how and why. One of the books that, we, that you need to read when you're trading the grain and energy futures are books about probability and chaos and risk. And the one on the left is, of course, Nat, uh, uh, Nisan uh, Taleb's book, The Black Swan, which was called by the London Times several years ago, one of the 10 most important books in the last 100 years in science. And of course, it, it actually is. And another one here is Nonlinear Dynamics and Chaos Theory. So that's, those are books that you need to read. Here's another one, Chaos and Nonlinear Dynamics. And what's interesting about this book is that just the cover of it is interesting. Take a look at this right in here. This is almost like a Rex block. <laughs> Take, this almost looks like a jet stream pattern here, doesn't it? And that's the reason for that. Remember, Chaos Theory was discovered by a meteorologist. And of course, Daniel Kahneman's book, the great book, uh, Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow. All very, very great books indeed. Okay. Um, and Taleb says here in a very nice quote, when you develop your opinions on the basis of weak evidence, you have difficulty interpreting the subsequent information that contradicts your opinion, even if the new information is obviously more accurate. That is a brilliant, brilliant quote. And let's take a look at this. Now, this was, I showed this before, this was the GFS models from uh, uh, the Friday before the storm. And you can see how the GFS, this is the new FE3, okay? So this is the new and improved uh, FE3 model here. Okay, this is the one that's going to replace the GFS in January of 2019. Okay, so this is going to be really a big improvement. Sorry, I'm writing a sloppily, but anyway. Okay, this is the FV3. That's the important point. So you can see here, this was Friday at midday. And I, again, notice the, the, the significant snow line is just into Richmond. Then Friday afternoon, and then on a, a Saturday morning. It now has 14 inches of snow south of Richmond, 5 inches north of Richmond. So it's clearly shifting to the north. This was the 6Z GFS model. And again, it showed substantial snowfall, and that turned out to be a pretty good map model. This was the NAM from uh, Friday afternoon and Friday evening. And uh, excuse me, us uh, uh, from uh, the 12, uh, let's see, the, this was um, the NAM. Oh, yeah, I see. So one on the left was the NAM, and the other one on the right is the Canadian short range model. And again, you can see really really accurate excellent forecasting here all this data was piling up friday friday afternoon friday night saturday morning and who was ignoring the data who was saying it's just models the models don't mean anything yes it was our friend zach daniels ignoring the models yeah good thinking there zach and of course we had this one here which was the nam also now here's the problem Weather is a nonlinear, it's a chaotic dynamic system, and nonlinearity is not normal. We're used to looking at things in the bell curve, and we know this one standard deviation, two standard deviations. You know, here's one standard deviation, here's the second one, here's the third over there, and we're used to seeing things in those terms. But in the real world, when you're dealing with weather, this does not work. Well, we talk about average, and what we're talking about is uh, so, so some average representation. So, for example, with a well-defined center. So let's say you had a room of people in the room. Most people are going to be between the five feet and six feet tall, right? And that's going to give you a certain distribution. But suppose the biggest person in the room, or let's say he's eight feet, the big, tallest person in the world walks into the circle. That eight-foot person is not only going to slightly disturb your average a little bit because there's so many other people which are, between eight, which are between five and six feet tall. And, of course, what happens is that as, as you get more and more numbers, the law of large numbers mean you get the bigger and bigger bell curve as you have more and more samples. But in the weather business and in chaotic systems, there is no normal because and you can't possibly have them because you're dealing with nonlinear systems. 
systems which are uh, dependent upon each other interact with each other in a very, very, very different way. For example, this was the crash from October 1987, Black Monday. This was a one day crash, which was a 22% drop off. And by the way, this is 22 or 20 standard deviations below the norm and that one drop off. This is virtually impossible to explain. And as a result, many of our uh, stock people, you know, your Wall Street uh, trader, what have you, was stunned and surprised by how severe this crash was and couldn't possibly explain it. And a lot of people got wiped out because they weren't anticipating this sort of reaction. Because within, within this, it doesn't happen. But when you get within that, it does. So that's an example of how nonlinear systems can cause real huge changes. And again, again, you can see um, this is virtually impossible in a normal distribution. But when you have a uh, power law distribution where you have the fat tail, you end up with your black swan, your unusual event over here. So this is a much longer significant probability at the tail end of the system and your probabilities than what you have over here. So that's why this is important. And again, <clears throat> you have your swans and then your black swan comes along and, and throws the whole system off. So in your, uh, for, and if we use our, height argument again so in this group here everybody here is between five feet and six feet here comes an eight foot man comes along doesn't disturb anything but in this case let's say we had money okay this is a, this is the average person's wealth now it comes in warren buffett or jeff bezos or uh, uh, the head of microsoft worth billions and billions of dollars they walk into our sample and it throws the whole distribution off because it's a black swan, it's not. It's 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 something different than what is supposed to happen. So what happens is values diverge from the average. So we end up having no average in linear systems. It's like asking what is the weight of stone or what how long is a rope. It, it's a question that doesn't mean anything. So and as a result, the because you have nonlinear systems, the results end up scattering either side of the bell curve, and you end up getting a totally different distribution where freak events are much more likely to happen. And we can see that exponential relationship the uh, between size and the event and the frequency of the occurrence. I mean that happens whether you're dealing with traffic patterns or uh, a stock market crash or extreme weather events. And just to show you the point, again, to drive home the point, you flip a coin, okay, all these different times, right? They're not related to each other. What, how many times, if you flip a coin uh, 50 times and 49 times it comes up heads, the chances of it coming up tails or heads the next time is still 50-50. If you go gamble at a casino, at a blackjack it's black or, or, or uh, one of those machines at the, at, the, at the casinos, it doesn't do anything. It, it, it's not connected. It doesn't, there's, it's just a purely random event. But when you're dealing with, let's say, activity on the internet or the stock market or weather systems, which are all connected, it's, there are too many variables and they are all connected. And that's why you can't use the normal bell curve. So as, what this means is essentially the term one in 500 year storm is essentially gibberish. You see that all over the place. It doesn't mean anything because it's not true not with extreme events okay so because the atmosphere is both a fluid and a li liquid it is ultimate chaotic nonlinear system key point here we all know that at certain times the pattern of the atmosphere becomes favorable for extreme events to occur teleconnections we talk about them all the time the maddie and julian oscillation that significantly increased the probability of an east coast winter storm or patterns that favor atlantic hurricanes turning out to sea or hitting the East Coast, or going to the Gulf of Mexico. These things happen in the atmosphere, and they make the patterns becoming dramatically more favorable for short intervals of time as opposed to over a 100-year period. So when Zach Daniels or some meteorologist comes out and says, this has never happened before, how often does this happen? It's absurd, absolutely absurd, to cite the history of Richmond over 100 years snowfall or DC or any city as a guide to forecasting big snowstorms and extreme events. By definition, extreme events are not on the bell curve I just showed you. To say the models uh, were uh, just lucky, you know, uh, that's just a stupid thing to say. It just, it is because they weren't lucky, they were right. You know, 
The managerial and oscillation in December in phase three favors an east coast snowstorm. I showed this many times that week. When you have a negative Arctic oscillation, a negative North American oscillation, a negative Eastern Pacific oscillation, and a positive PNA, again, if you're a weather nut and a snowstorm fanatic, you know what those things mean. They mean the pattern becomes favorable for East Coast snowstorms. So obviously, you want to compare those patterns to when you don't have those patterns. That's how you know one pattern is more favorable than another one. You simply can't look over 100 years and see, see well, We've never had a 10-inch snowstorm in July, so I guess that means we can't get one in February. That's essentially what he's arguing. It's just really, it's just, it's, it's ludicrous. It's just a ludicrous argument. Remember, statistically speaking, okay, again, how often does it happen? Remember that quote? It never happens. Statistically speaking, Sandy will never take that track, should never have taken that track into New Jersey. Never. It's never happened before. Harvey never stalls over Houston. And floods it out. It's never happened before. Maria never cuts across Puerto Rico diagonally, the length of the island. Never happened before. Not not a Category 4 hurricane. Never done that. And Washington, D.C., Maryland, Northern Virginia, has never seen two blizzards only four days apart in the winter of 2009-2010. Never happened before. Isabel tracks northwest into eastern North Carolina, eastern West Virginia, 2003. Last time that happened was 1933. And yet before that, it happened, I don't know, just after the Civil War. It doesn't happen very often. Statistically speaking, if you're going to say, how often does this happen, get out of the weather business. I mean, this is what you gear up for. You have to be able to see the extreme events with the coming, because that's when the forecasts become most important. It's easy to get the sunny day in May at 75 degrees. It's easy to get that forecast correct. All right, let's go on to the forecast. My rant is over. All right. I know it seemed like I was bashing, and I suppose to some ways I was, but I'm not bashing the person. I'm bashing the mentality about saying it. how often does it happen, it can't happen, that sort of thing. Okay. Yes, now to show you the point that I always forecast big snows and big cold patterns, here's my a post I made back on November 29th, where I said after December 10th, the cold pattern was going to collapse and we would turn mild for most of December. Again, if I'm always forecasting snow and cold, how am I talking about a warm pattern? Anybody? Okay. That was a post I made. I showed it early, November 29th. Again, and I explained why. The teleconnections were going to break down. The polar vortex is going to change position. The Pacific jet is going to come roaring in. And the teleconnections were going to go into the toilet. And we were going to turn mild for the middle and second half of December. Now here's the pattern on December 17th. And this is a bad pattern if you like winter weather. We have a series of troughs coming through here. There's uh, one right here, another one on the west coast, this one right here. There's nothing going on here, which is in remotely favorable for winter weather. It's all Pacific energy. If you look at it hemispherically, we can see nothing. We have a positive Arctic oscillation um, right in um, here, part of the, right in that area here. We have a trough in the Gulf of Alaska. We have a positive EPO. <sighs> nothing on the west coast. The NAO is either neutral or positive. It's just, it's not doing anything. It's a bad pattern. Now, as we go towards Friday and Saturday, here's a big storm for Friday, Thursday and Friday. A lot of rain, warm temperatures on the East Coast, maybe even some thunder. Notice this is a negatively tilted track right here, trough. You can see the trough, see how it runs in this direction, northwest to southeast. So the low pressure area is here, wars off the coast, strong winds along the coast, maybe some thunderstorms. I wouldn't rule it out on Thursday night or Friday in some areas on the East Coast. Look at this. Look at this monster, right at the spine of the Appalachians. I mean, it's going to rain in Albany. <laughs> I mean, that's a warm pattern for December. It's raining in Albany. That's a warm pattern. And then if you look at the extended models, this is Christmas Day. Nothing. <laughs> we have a trough on the West Coast. Okay, no ridge on the west coast at all. We have a trough here, all right? The we have a the, right there the Arctic Oscillation and the NEO are both positive. This is a this is a non-pattern. This is all Pacific air. No Arctic flow at all. All the Arctic air is up in here. Now, I'm sure many of you can say, well, you know, the weather models could be wrong. They're you know they're, they're they're always wrong. And if many, in fact, some of you will cite this. Now, this came out several days ago back on December uh, 13th. And they said, oh my God, a Christmas Day snowstorm for Virginia and Maryland. Yeah. No. Any weather model, 
that shows an East Coast winter storm when the teleconnections are this bad or the Manny Julian oscillation is in phase four, five, and six, it should be ignored. You're going to see this for the next couple of weeks, ignore it. Until the teleconnections shift, until the MGO shifts, ignore it. It's bullshit. It's not going to happen. Okay. Here's the teleconnections for uh, today. You can see that the PNA uh, is positive, it's tanking, very bad, trough on the West Coast. Okay, the NEO essentially neutral, and the Eastern Pacific Oscillation is positive. Remember, we want this to be negative. This means uh, when you're positive, that means uh, you have an upper low over Alaska. Uh, so that's what you want it. You want this to be negative. You want this to be negative. And of course, we want this to be positive. And you can see exact opposite of what happens if you like winter weather. And if we look at the Arctic Oscillation, look what happens. Right now, it's slightly negative. December 22nd drops down here. And then it goes neutral. Not great, not horrible, but not great. Let's talk about the Madden drill oscillation. And again, the snowstorm occurred when I started talking about it was when the Madden drill oscillation was here. This is December 9th, December 8th. And I said in phase two, it, that supports a snowstorm pattern on the East Coast. And that's exactly what happened. So now if some meteorologists on television doesn't know the connection between the MJO and snowstorm patterns on the East Coast. That doesn't mean I'm full of shit. It means that they don't know what they're doing with the MJO and snowstorms. That's fine. Not everybody knows everything. You know? Okay. Now here's the current MJO right here. Let's point out there's phase four. See that? There it is, phase four. What does that mean? Yee. Well, if we follow the models, you can see the European here and the Japanese model through January 14th, they slowly meander it through phase four and five, maybe into phase six. The Japanese model by Christmas is still in phase five, about to go into phase six. So what does that mean? Well, oops, let me go. When you see a warm white pattern like this, look at the MJO in phase four, phase five, and phase six. Look at the warm temperatures. Oh my God, this is a bad second half of December. Okay. And look at the overall pattern here, phase five and phase six. Both these models, massive trough on the West Coast, big ridge on the East Coast, positive Arctic oscillation, positive NEO. This is not snowstorm winter pattern. Not, not, not. Okay, not for the rest of the month. Now, here's long term. Okay, this is an experimental uh, MJO from Kyle McRitchie. And you can see that by January, beginning of January, it goes into phase seven and kind of moves towards phase eight a little bit. So that's some positive. Now, this is the CFS 16 to 20 day. Again, nothing. Uh, it's, a, it's a mild Pacific pattern, as you can see. No reason to get excited here whatsoever. This takes us to January 5th. What about the sudden stratospheric warming? This bubble of warm air, which is showing up on the models. Uh, what does that do? Now, this is the current jet stream uh, 10 millibar pat map here at the very top of the atmosphere, almost by outer space. So we have a big bubble of warm air here, the big bubble of cold air here. This is December 17th. So what's going to happen is uh, we're going to get this warming bubble. So here we have it's December 17th and December 24th. Look at the explosion here of warmth in the atmosphere, at the top of the atmosphere right here. See that? Boom! This whole thing explodes. And what that does is it, be, it causes the Arctic vortex. It causes, it causes the polar vortex to split, which causes the Arctic oscillation phase to change. So this is December 28th and December 31st. And you can see this huge bubble of very, very warm air getting up into the North Pole and causing the polar vortex to change position here. That's the theory behind it. We'll see if it actually develops, but that's the theory. If that happens, the pattern changes. This is the CFS for the middle of January. Now, this is a long way out, but you can see huge ridge on the West Coast east coast here strong blocking over greenland this has everything you want for a snowstorm on the east coast but this is five weeks out mid-january okay there you go um uh supporting that we have the new european weekly now this is the european weekly for january 6th the pattern finally turns we get a bit of a ridge on the west coast moderate cold here there's a trough here this is probably a great lakes new england snowstorm in this area we're getting some building heights here moderate ridge here nothing in Alaska yet just a moderate ridge on the west coast but finally getting cold here on January 5th and 6th you see that date up there okay and then after that January 12th now this is damn exciting now this is a long way out I grant you but this this, this is this is exciting as hell um, 
strong blocking here big ridge on the west coast uh, in Alaska pause a negative EPL look at that negative anomaly in the, in the deep south here that's screaming snowstorm and this is another one for uh, that's the 12th and 13th so you can see the anomaly goes here we still have our big uh, ridge on the west coast strong blocking here this has got a lot of potentially in mid-January I like this a lot we'll see if it happens it might not so it could be all bullshit and then here's January 19th and then January 26th and we can see again very very strong ridging on the west coast the eastern pacific oscillation here negative arctic oscillation negative nao big trough on the east coast another one here look at this blocking up here good googly moogly this is a long way off i don't know if it's going to happen but there are reasons to be optimistic for january after january 5th or 6th so give it time but until then we got nothing this is meteorologist dt from weatherrisk.com i'll talk to you soon see you on the facebook page and on the twitter page